number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a woman called Mrs. Reynolds being interviewed by a police officer about an incident she saw the previous evening. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Well, if you can just tell me everything you remember, it doesn't matter how trivial it seems. What may seem unimportant to you may not be unimportant to us. OK, I'll do what I can, officer. Well, as I said, i just come out of the cinema on the high street, so it was about... Eight o'clock, just before eight, in fact. I'd been to see a film with a friend, and she'd just gone off home. So I was just standing there wondering what to do, whether to go and have a cup of coffee somewhere or not. I was just standing there, minding my own business, when I suddenly heard someone shouting directly opposite me outside the library. Not screaming, just shouting. It sounded like the voice of an elderly woman. They've got my bag! They've got my bag! She was shouting. Then these two men raced past me, going like the wind, straight down the street and round the corner into West Street. It all happened so quickly, I think they must have had a car waiting for them there because I heard one drive off at top speed. Well, I didn't know what on earth to do, whether to try and chase them, whether to ring the police, or whether to go and see if she was all right. Another woman was running up behind me, so I shouted back at her to go and call the police. Anyway, when I got to the woman, she seemed to be all right, thank goodness. A bit shaken but okay i think i was much more upset than she was all in all she was pretty calm i don't think i would have been but apparently it had happened to her once before so maybe that's why you know i've got a friend who refuses to go out alone anywhere after six o'clock now <laughs> what's this town coming to before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Well, anyway, she just kept saying, I didn't see a thing. I didn't see a thing. One of them had just pushed her from behind, and as she put out a hand to steady herself, the other one had just taken the bag from under her arm, and then he raced off across the road. I asked her what she'd had in it, and she said she'd had her purse with about 15 pounds in it, but no checkbook or cards or things like that. And luckily, she had her front door key in her pocket. Oh, and she'd had her bus pass taken too. Let's get back to the two men, if we can. Just tell me everything you can remember about them. Well, there was a younger one and an older one. Well, let's start with the younger one, shall we? 
Well, age first, then. He only looked about 17, not more, something like that. Neither very tall nor small. Sort of slim build. Not anybody you'd notice. Nothing particularly special about him. An ordinary-looking sort of bloke. He had curly black hair, which was quite long. But apart from that, as I say, not someone you'd notice in a crowd. Nothing really distinct about him at all. But the other one, the older one, he was different. Different? Yes, different. <laughs> I feel as if I'd know him anywhere again. I got more of a look at him, because he ran across the road more slowly than the younger man. I remember being surprised, because he was quite a bit older than the other one. I'd say about... 35. Funny, because you don't think of people of that age snatching handbags in broad daylight like that, do you? He was quite a bit smaller than the other man, and medium build. What did he look like? You didn't give the officer much information last night. Well, I did get quite a good look at his face. No beard or moustache, clean-shaven, and uh, quite smart-looking, really. He had light brown hair cut very short, a sort of army haircut. And there was another thing. Thinking about it all last night, over and over again, I'm almost sure he had a small scar on his chin. Now, I didn't tell the other policeman that last night, but in my mind, each time I see his face, I can see one. A scar on his chin? Hmm. That could be important. Thank you, Mrs Reynolds. You've been really helpful. If you really think you'd recognise him again, then what we'd like you to do later this morning, if you can, is to come down to the police station and look at a few photographs for us. See if any of those ring a bell. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an English hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the Bridge Hotel Information Line. The Bridge Hotel is part of the Compact Group, which is a large association of family-owned hotels, offering a warm, friendly atmosphere and high-quality service at competitive prices. All of them cater for a wide range of people, from business to leisure clients. Set in a quiet residential area on the attractive outskirts of Belford, about three miles from the city centre, the Bridge Hotel is a popular choice for conferences. After recent refurbishment and expansion, it now has 25 double rooms and 20 singles. All 45 are en suite with TV and coffee and tea making facilities. The Bridge Hotel is set in three and a half hectares of grounds, with an open-air swimming pool and four tennis courts. There is also a newly opened gym with fitness suite, which is considered one of the best equipped in the area. Non-resident membership is available. We have a fully licensed restaurant for residents and non-residents, which provides a wide range of dishes, with a particular focus on dishes from around the world. For the discerning business customer, 
We have designated business rooms with phone links allowing full internet access. Our conference facilities cater for up to 200 delegates, and we are able to offer transport to guests to and from Birmingham Airport at a small extra cost. Before you hear the rest of the message, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. There now follows information about short break packages. Welcome to the Bridge Hotel Short Breaks Information Line. We offer three packages, two-day, three-day and five-day. The two-day costs £75 per person per night and includes full cooked breakfast and evening entertainment. Very popular for weekend getaways. The three-day break costs £60 per person per night, and in addition to offers for the two-day break, includes one four-course dinner. This allows guests to enjoy the full range of hotel facilities. The five-day break costs £52 per person per night, and in addition to offers from the two- and three-day breaks, includes free beauty therapy on two days and a full-day pass to a golf club. This package is particularly popular with couples who want a completely relaxing break. If you would like more information about these special packages, call extension 3469 to speak to our customer service manager, John Martin. Thank you for calling the Bridge Hotel Information Line. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear three students talking about their study programs. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Elaine. I was hoping I'd see you here. How are things? All right. You? Uh, not bad, but I'm beginning to worry about that assignment. What? The one on theory and practice? Yes. Uh, when's it got to be in by? Uh, next Thursday. And I just can't get to grips with it. Yes, it's a tricky one. I'm hoping to get down to it over the weekend. I, I tell you what, there's Dinah. <laughs> Let's see if she has any pearls of wisdom on the subject. She took the theory and practice option last year, didn't she? And got an A-plus for it, I think. How does she do it? Oh, let's ask her. Hi, Dinah. Hard at work. Not exactly. The lecture's just been cancelled, so I've suddenly got a free morning on my hands. Oh, that's lucky. You've met Neil, haven't you? Yes. We were just talking about the theory and practice assignment we've got to hand in next. Can we just pick your brains a moment? How far have you got with it? Well, still at the reading stage, really. Are you? Well, one bit of advice I definitely give is not to spend hours wading through that massive volume by Jesperson. It really isn't very helpful. I think the only reason they keep it on the reading list is that the library has got so many copies of it. Personally, I found the essential source was Parisi. 
Have you read her yet? Crazy? Oh, I don't think so. That's a great book. It must be on your reading list. Right. Another one I found very useful was the article called something like Practical Theories by... Mm, was it Williams or Willard? Yes, Willard. Also, if you want to look at case studies, that small book of Ron Brown's has got some interesting stuff in. You know the one I mean? Ron Brown? Yes, I looked for it in the library, but it was out on loan. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Yes, it's a very popular book. Did you try the recall system? The what? Don't you use the recall system? You should, you know. You just have to take a pink slip from any of the librarian's desks, fill the details of the book in, put your departmental address on the back, your departmental address, not your home address, and hand the slip in at the information desk. Then, check the mail in your department twice a day, say at 10 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon, for a slip telling you the book is ready to collect. Last week, I recalled a book at lunchtime and got the slip telling me it was ready just four hours later. That was exceptional. It usually takes about three days. I didn't know you could do that. Is it expensive? No. There's a nominal charge, 25 pence a book, I think. It's well worth it if you're preparing for an assignment. Are you going to be working together on it? Uh, I'm not sure. I would if I were you. You get so much more out of the assignment that way. But surely the tutors would notice that our essays were the same. No, no. I'm certainly not suggesting you should actually write the thing together. I'm talking about when you first start on a big assignment. I think it's a good idea to find two or three others on the course who live near you and divide up the reading load between you. Then you can meet up again a few days later and take it in turns to summarize your reading for each other. At the next stage, we go around the group explaining our essay plans, which makes it easier for individuals then to go off and write the first draft of their essay on their own. Later on, we usually exchange drafts and give feedback in the group before finally writing our essays individually. Do you really do all that? Usually, yes. It makes the whole thing much easier and more enjoyable. Right. Well, I think I need another coffee before getting started. Uh, can I get you one? Yes, why not? That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk by a university lecturer in Australia on a type of bird called a peregrine falcon. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'm Professor Sam Richards and I've come as the third guest lecturer on this course in Australian Birds of Prey. My job is to keep a watchful scientific eye on the state of Tasmanian peregrines 
So I'll start by giving you some background to these magnificent birds of prey before I speak briefly on my own project. Peregrine falcons are found on all continents with the exception of Antarctica, so don't go looking for them at the South Pole. They're found almost everywhere in Australia, and it's interesting to note that the name peregrine implies that they're wanderers, that they move from place to place following the seasons, and indeed in most parts of the world they're migratory birds. But not in Australia, however, where they prefer to stay in one place. They're known to be the world's fastest creature, and they have been tracked by radar diving down towards the ground at 180 kilometres an hour. However, a number of textbooks claim that their flight speed can go as high as 350 kilometres an hour, so there's still some dispute about just how fast they can actually fly. Female peregrine falcons, like all other Australian falcons, are larger than their male counterparts. In fact, the female is almost a third larger than the male in the case of peregrines. While she stays close to the nest to protect the eggs and the young chicks, the male is mostly occupied looking for food. Peregrines typically lay two or three eggs per nest, and after the eggs have hatched, when the chicks are about 20 days old, they start to fly. So they fly at a very young age. By the time they're just 28 days old, they've already reached full adult size. In other words, they're fully grown. Soon after this, at about two months after hatching from the egg, they leave the nest for good. From this point on, they're on their own. Unlike their parents, which have learned how to hunt, the young falcons are not good at feeding themselves, and so during the first year, about 60% of them die. Once the birds have managed to live to breeding age, at two years old, they generally go on to live for another six or seven years. When we come across nests with young chicks, the first thing we do is catch the chicks before they're able to fly. We have to catch them at an early age. We then attach identification rings to their legs. These rings are made of colour-coded aluminium, and they allow us to identify the birds through binoculars later in their lives. Thirdly, because we need to know how many males and how many female chicks are being born, we note the sex of the chicks. Noting the sex of the birds is a vital part of our research, as I will discuss later. The next thing to do is to take a blood sample from the chicks. We take the blood sample so that we can check the level of pesticide in their bodies. Peregrine falcons can build dangerous quantities of pesticides in their bloodstream by feeding on smaller mammals, which in turn feed on crops grown on farms where pesticides are used. Finally, we check the birds thoroughly, really checking the birds for their general health. This whole process only takes a few minutes. In fact, most of our time in the field is actually spent trying to find the nests, not on the data collection itself. Well, that's all I have for you today.